before we get started, first of all, welcome to Outdoor Worship. My name is Lynn, and I am the worship director here. And we have been blessed with a beautiful morning, so we're really excited about that. If you are new, this is not normal. <laughs> Uh, but we do want to meet you, and we have a black table. I'm sure you've all found the popcorn machine. It has a big uh, sign that says popcorn. Just in front of the popcorn machine is a black table. And if you are new, we will have our connections team at that table, and they want to meet you and get to know you, and they have a little gift for you. So make sure you stop on by. Around or near that black table, you'll also find our offertory boxes for today if you give in person. That's where you'll find that. Uh, we want to welcome Jason and Adina Helmholt and their four kids with us from Bonaire. Uh, we're going to get to hear from them in a little bit and about what they're doing and how we support them. And then our kids up through fourth grade have a great opportunity to go inside about halfway through the service with them and do some learning together. Um, so we're really excited about that. If you have up through two, you can check them in at nursery uh, right now. I think that is all. Oh. Uh, tomorrow, we didn't have our block party last week because of the rain, but tomorrow looks great. And so tomorrow we're going to meet for ice cream. Um, and so there's information about that in your bulletin. Lots of other good stuff too, so make sure you check that out. Uh, we're going to get started with a time of worship, with a time of singing. So can you stand? And I'm going to read Psalm 34 um, as we start our time together this morning. Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Magnify the Lord with me. Let's exalt his name together. Let's worship the King.
I'm going to be able to shout at all the worst. Um, all right, maybe you know that this is the older hymn. This is my father's world. Let's see how we do.
how great is our God. That's the message that we get to sing this morning. And listen, we get to join in with all that you see around us. All of nature, all of creation is saying the exact same thing with us. Psalm 19 says the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. And so we are gathered here in God's sanctuary this morning with all of creation singing praise to our great God. And what a great day for it. Couldn't be any better, right? We are so glad that you're here. My name is Bill. I'm the lead pastor here at Cascade. And if it's your first time here, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so glad you're here this morning. Uh, each morning we start by singing like we just did to praise God. And then we acknowledge, listen, we are here enjoying each other's presence, each other's company, each other's fellowship. We're also here enjoying fellowship with God himself who greets us here this morning as well. And he greets us here with love and mercy through Christ Jesus. Let's greet one another in that same spirit and then please be seated. everybody. What a beautiful morning. What a great, amazing way to start the morning. My name is Lisa Grunewald. One of my roles on staff here is as liaison for Global Missions. And this morning, I have the privilege of introducing you to one of our mission partners. Because of the generous giving of this congregation, we are currently able to support 21 mission partners. And one of those mission partners we are even the sending church for, which is pretty amazing. At this time, I would like to invite Jason and Adina and their family to come forward. Jason and Adina have been mission partners with us for the last three years. They are, Jason is the son of Pat and Nancy Helmholtz. They have four kids, as you can see. Ainsley is 14, Isaac is 12, Hazel is 11 and Josie is nine. They live on the island of Bonaire and Jason works with Transworld Radio. Guys, it's so great to have you here today. Super excited. Um, wondering if you could just share a little bit about what your role is and the context in which you serve. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for having us here. It's, it's, uh, it's an amazing setup and uh, yeah, great morning for it. Um, so in, with TWR, I'm the station director in Bonaire. Uh, and that's a station director of, we have an AM station and an FM station. And uh, the AM station is actually the largest radio station in the Western Hemisphere and most powerful. So we hit about 100 million people every day throughout Latin America uh, with different gospel programs. And then we also have an FM station that we do right on the island. Um, so it's, we kind of got a dual ministry there. We get the, to get to reach everyone in Latin America. But then we're also on this little island where we get to be uh, part of the community there. There's about 20,000 people there that, uh, that we work on reaching as well. So, Wow, I'm sure that that keeps you very busy. <laughs> it's, it's a busy time, yep. And on top of that, Adina runs the children's ministry at one of the local churches as well. So, Okay. Uh, wondering if you guys would be willing to share a story about a time where you see God at work through in and through you. Yeah, hey, absolutely. Uh, now, with, with Transworld Radio, we have offices all around South America in a bunch of different countries. So most of our listeners, when they uh, get in contact with someone, it's usually at one of the different offices in their home country. Uh, but every now and then, we do get people that come to the island just to see where it, where it comes from. Uh, the most recent one, we had a couple from Brazil that came. And uh, the guy was telling me that he grew up listening to Transworld Radio and got saved by Transworld, uh, listening to uh, Transworld Radio. And so for him, it was just a big thing to come and see where that actually took place at. And so every now and then we get, uh, we do get visitors that come to the island and it's just cool to see when they walk into our offices, like it's, it's the greatest thing. Like people have said they've saved up for like 40 years to come see Bonaire because they always hear Bonaire on the radio and they listen to Transworld Radio, but uh, to actually come and see it's always a big thing. So it's neat for us to, 
to kind of get that listener uh, response in person and get to see how God has worked in these different people's lives and just to hear their stories on the impact that, that our radio has had in their lives. Uh, we had one, one family that came, the dad and his brother were there, and they got saved as teenagers uh, through Transworld Radio. And then now through that, their kids were there as well, and they were uh, maybe in their 20s. And the kids had all been saved, and now the kids were all in ministry, doing different ministry things. I think they were in Puerto Rico at the time. Uh, but just to hear those stories of, of how God works through that and just how uh, how the radio can reach all these different people. Amazing. So awesome. Uh, but I'm sure it's not, not all always easy. And so I'm wondering if you could share some of your challenges or maybe how we can be in prayer for you. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, a few different things. I mean, for one, the kids, uh, it's always, always a challenge raising kids. And they all go to school at a Dutch school, so it's 100% Dutch. And so that's been a fun transition. But they're all doing awesome in that. But yeah, always, always prayers for uh, for them. Um, also at the radio station, uh, we have a few staff members leaving this year, so we're we're paring down quite a bit, uh, which will put a little bit more work on the few of us that are still there. Um, so just prayers for uh, for more staff coming in. Um, and uh, yeah, anything you want to add? Yeah, I think as Jason said to the kids, that's a main focus for me as well. And I think all of kids anywhere need prayer for just growing up in this world. And so yeah. Um, Isaac will start a new high school adventure uh, next year, and then, yeah, and the kids, just prayers for, yeah, just being in a positive environment, people in their lives that are going to help them. Do you guys think of anything? <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys so much for being here. Right there, yeah, thanks. So um, I'm going to transition right now uh, into prayer time, and I'm going to do things a little bit different today. One of my other roles on staff is as the elementary ministry lead. And so for prayer time today, I would like to invite all of our kids up through fourth grade to come forward and to gather up here by the family. You can start coming up now. That would be awesome. And we're gonna pray for the family together. We're gonna do what's called an echo prayer. So come on up guys, come on up. We're gonna do what's called an echo prayer. Yeah. Gather around. Gather around, guys. Come forward. So we're going to do what's called an echo prayer. So that means I'm going to say something, and you guys are going to repeat after me. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Congregation, we may need your help as well. Um, once we're done with the echo prayer, then I'm going to close us in prayer, and the kids up through fourth grade can follow me to Cascade Kids where these wonderful kids are going to be joining us for some question and answer, some Bible time, and all that kind of good stuff. So, is everybody ready? Yes? You ready? You're going to repeat after me? Here we go. Dear God, you are so good. Thank you for this family. Thank you that they are here today. Thank you that they love Jesus. Help them show Jesus to others. Keep them safe. Give them strength. May they give you glory in all they do. Amen. Okay, now I will close us in prayer. God, please be with our church family and for all those who are sick or hurting. Give them healing and peace. Thanks for all you do for us. Thank you for giving us gifts and for using us in your world. Help us to be a light for you, to our friends and neighbors. Show us how we can be more like you. Forgive our sins, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, at this time, kids up through fourth grade can follow me. We're gonna go up to Cascade Kids and uh, have our own special time of worship and learning and get to hear a little bit from the missionary kids.
Well, good morning again, everybody. Every week that we gather together as the people of God, we center ourselves around the Word of God to hear Him speak to us, and we'll do that now. As we continue our summer sum, uh, sermon series, now that's a good question. If you're new, uh, what we've been doing this summer is I've just invited you to send me the toughest, roughest questions that you've got, and you did not hold back. I got some really good questions. We've been tackling them one at a time. We talked about, uh, is there really such a thing as hell and what happens when you die? What's heaven like? Uh, over the past little series of weeks, we've been talking about the church and difficult questions about the church. A lot of people today have big questions about the church, and I have a heart for meeting those people where they are and answering those questions. So uh, two weeks ago, we took on this question, why should I care about church? Why should I be here this morning rather than doing something else? Why should I be a member of one? Why should I care about one? And we found that there are good answers, and the world needs to know those good answers. So I invite you, if you missed that sermon, it's on the website. Make sure to check that out and hit rewind and watch that. Now, last week, we answered a related question, which I think may be one of the reasons people don't care about church anymore. The question people are asking is, why are Christians so judgmental? Remember, we asked that last week, and we said one of the main reasons people don't like coming to church is because church is filled with hypocrites and people that don't do what they say they do, but judge other people on the outside for doing those exact same things. Again, we had an answer for that. I won't spend our time this morning reviewing that, but definitely look up that sermon online if you're interested. Uh, for today, I want to do one more question that's related to the church. And perhaps another reason that people today are walking away from the church. And that reason is they simply don't believe anymore. That reason is that many people, some that you know, maybe your kids, maybe your co-workers, maybe your neighbors, maybe you would ask this question, how do I know that Christianity is the right religion. Of all the options out there, what are the chances that I just got born into or happened upon the church that is the correct religion? How do I know that this faith is true, that not all religions are basically the same and no spirituality is basically any better than the other, right? And I think behind and underneath that question is the one I want to really delve into today, which is how do we know this book is true. How do we know that what I'm holding in my hands is different than every other book about spirituality? Uh, how do we know that, you know, people say a lot of things about this book. People say that it's just a book of myths. It's just a book of moral principles. It's like Aesop's fables. People say it's maybe 20% historically accurate, if that. Some would say this book is just 0% accurate, that it's invented to deceive people and control people. And so into all of that, I want to convince you, by the time we're done this morning, to consider that this book really is different than all the rest. That there's good reason to trust what this book says is true. And there are good reasons to form our entire lives around the message of this book and Jesus, who it points us to. And so before we delve in, as always, I would invite you to pray with me, and we're going to pray together that God would speak and that we would listen as he speaks to us. Well, God, I thank you that you are willing to hear our hard questions. And we're bringing you hard questions in this series, but God, I know I know that nothing is too hard for you. And I know, I know you don't have any problem with us bringing these questions to you. And I know that you'll patiently meet us where we are, even with all these questions. Well, today we're asking, how can we be sure that the Bible is actually your word? That it's true. And as we study together, God, I pray, as I always do, that you'll speak to us because I know that you do. And so God, our real prayer is, help us be thankful for that. 
Help us be grateful that you are a God who speaks to us. And help us to listen. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you have a Bible with you today. If not a regular analog Bible, then maybe your phone. Uh, I usually preach with the TV beside me to help you see as I progress through the verses and see what we're looking at. I don't have a TV this morning, so it's really important you have the Word in front of you. Uh, so if you have your Bible, open it to 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, I'd encourage you to uh, download the Bible app on your phone real quick. Or just go to a website on your phone and, and Google 2 Timothy 3, and it'll come right up. Uh, as you are turning there, a little background about what we'll be studying together this morning. Uh, this is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to his protege, to his apprentice, to his successor, uh, Timothy, a young guy who is based in Ephesus. He's leading the church there, helping lead the church in Ephesus. And Timothy was encountering, as all ministers do, various challenges. And among those challenges were false teachers and those who, Paul said, were evil people that were straying away from the truth. And into that circumstance, Paul writes these words to Timothy. Let's read from verse, uh, verse 14 to verse 17. Paul says, in contrast to these evil people who have gone away from the truth, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and what you've been convinced of, because you know from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. All scripture is God-breathed. And it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And now, as we usually do, let me just go through these verses one at a time. Uh, I believe, as we'll see this morning, that every single word we just read is there for a reason, that God has put it there for a reason. And so it would behoove us to pay attention to these words. The first word I want you to look at is uh, this word in verse 14. It has to be continue, continue on. So Paul, again, is telling Timothy, there are people in your context, in your day, around you, in the culture, even in the church, who have decided not to continue on the path of what the scriptures say. Uh, there are people who have strayed from it and have went their own way and decided it's not good enough what the Bible says. They wanted a different theology, a, a new theology, a new way, a new moral set of beliefs. And Paul says in contrast to that, Timothy, listen, my, my encouragement for you is that you would continue on. There are people who are deleting from the Word. There are people who are adding to the Word. There are people who are modifying it, changing it. And Paul says, you don't get to do that. You don't get to do that with the Scriptures. You continue on in them. You hold fast to them. And you don't sit over them and judge which parts you're going to keep and which parts you're going to apply and which parts need some revising and which parts you just get rid of. You don't do that. You don't sit over the Word. You sit under the Word. And you let the Word sit over you. So that's where Paul starts. And next he says this as we continue on. Why should Timothy continue on? Well, for good reason, because you know from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, Timothy should con continue on for a bunch of reasons, but for one, because he knows he learned this from trustworthy sources, people he trusts. And in verse 16, even more importantly now, our really key point we want to camp out, camp out on for quite a while this morning. Why should you continue on, Timothy? Because, verse 16, all Scripture is God-breathed. Period. Well, actually, it's not a period there, but let's, let's, uh, let's put a period for a second. Let's put a pause here and just pause there to think about what that means. It's such a radical statement, right, that the Scriptures are God-breathed. The scriptures, at least this morning, are claiming for themselves that they are God-breathed. What does that mean? 
Well, Paul wrote this original letter not in English. English didn't exist back then, and so he was writing in the Greek language. And in Greek, this appears as theo, uh, theopneustos, which is just a conjug conjugation, a mashing together of two pre-existing Greek words. Theos, which means God, and pneustos, which means breath. You might see that like uh, pneumatic. You have a pneumatic drill that uses what? It uses air. And in scripture, air and breath and wind is all kind of the same word. God and breath. God breathed. And so, I don't know which version of the Bible you have in front of you. Different translations would put different English words around this. The, the King James Version says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. We talk about the scriptures as being inspired. That comes from here. Uh, I, for one, love the way the NIV has chosen to translate this because it just is literal. God, breath. The authors of the NIV, NIV said that's good enough for us. We're just going to say the, 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 author, the scripture is God breathed. It is like the breath of God on a page for us. All of these words were breathed out by God for us. Isn't that amazing? Just like I breathe out my words, my, my wind comes out of my lungs and through my vocal cords and I produce words through my breath. And those words reveal who I am. God, Scripture says, God has breathed out these words for us. It's a radical thing. It's not just like the Scriptures are inspired in the sense that Paul was really inspired when he wrote them. Like, you know, Beethoven was inspired. Like like a dancer and the nutcracker feels inspired. It's not just that. It's something so much deeper. It's not just that Paul and the other writers of Scripture wrote something and later on God breathed into their words and made them something they weren't. But Scripture claims for itself that every word we have has been breathed out by God Himself and is put there for a purpose for us. It is God breathed. It's utterly unique. And because these words we have are breathed out by God, that means something. As we continue on in verse 16, there's a consequence to that. All scripture is God breathed, and it makes sense then. It is useful. If God gives you a message, if God gives you words, those words are going to be useful, right? What are they useful for? Verse 16 again teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And so Paul, there's four words there that you can see in your Bible, teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. And those four words are divided into two halves. The first two are about what we believe, what we think, our creed. And the second two are about our conduct, how we behave. So Scripture is able to equip us to think right and to live right. Scripture cares about our creed and our conduct. So let's, let's look at those now. I said the first two are about our thinking, our creed. So Paul says, all scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching. What is teaching? You know what teaching is? You've been to school, most of you, I hope. Uh, teaching, learning new things. And we, as human beings, need to be taught who God is and what his will is. It doesn't come naturally to us. In fact, scripture is clear, quite the contrary. We're born in sin. And so our, our conceptions about God are all upside down. And as beautiful as this place is, and we can learn some things from God just by looking at these beautiful trees, the design of the leaves. We, we know that God exists. We know that God is powerful. But there are things beyond that we need to be taught about God. And the scripture, this is the place where we find those teachings. We need to be taught who God is. We need to be taught what his will is. We need to be taught who we are. We need to be taught what our problem is and how to solve that problem. And so Paul writes to Timothy and he says, listen, in this church in Ephesus, you're trying to take care of and all these people that need your help. Here's one thing that scripture is super useful for, teaching them, teaching them who I am and teaching them what my will is. So that's a positive aspect of creed, but there's a negative aspect as well in verse 16. The next word, all scriptures God breathes and useful for teaching and rebuking. 
And so if teaching is the positive aspect of having correct beliefs, rebuking is the negative aspect of having correct beliefs. Uh, Paul told Timothy, there are some people who have some wrong ideas about who I am. Paul would encounter people who have great misconceptions about who God is and how he operates in the world. And Paul says it's important to correct them and rebuke them. And guess what? The scripture is the best place to do that. Now the next word is about our conduct. So the scripture not only cares about our creed, the scripture cares about our conduct too. Scripture cares not just that you think right, but that you behave in line with those beliefs. And so Paul tells Timothy, all scriptures God breathes, and useful for teaching, rebuking, and correcting. So this time Paul starts with the negative aspect. And he says there are some people who are not behaving correctly. The world has begun to draw people from that church in Ephesus in. And those people have begun to follow the world's way of not only thinking, but also behaving. And so Paul tells Timothy, listen, you've got to use scripture to help get those people on the right path, on the straight and narrow, so to speak, on the right way to live. And if you're a parent, this makes sense, right? Uh, we, we don't like to be corrected, but if you're a parent, you get it that some things need to be corrected. And then it's a loving thing to correct people, right? I see some smiles, I see some looks between parents and children out there. If your child is running through this street right here, I hope you run after them, and I hope you correct them. That's the loving thing to do, right? If your child keeps on reaching for hot pans on the stove, I hope you correct them. It's the loving thing to correct them. And similarly, God is a loving Father, and He wants to correct us, too, from things that would harm us. His will, we've said this before, His will is not there to cramp our style and to, to punish us and make life a drudgery. His, His will for us, His rules for us, are for the best way of living. And so for us as church leaders, like Paul is writing Timothy, it's our duty to, to take care of you by sometimes correcting. People get off course. That's the loving thing to do. And Paul tells Timothy, guess what? You have a tool to do that, and it's the Bible. The Bible is useful for correcting. And then our last word, so all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So the fourth aspect now, again, with our conduct, is the positive aspect. Negative was correcting. Positive is simply this. People need training. Right? It's It's... It's any new skill that you're trying to learn, whether it's piano or tennis or anything in between. Uh, learning a new way of being and moving and existing and doing, it takes work and it takes effort and it takes training. And so Paul is encouraging Timothy here. Listen, in, in, in Ephesus, there are people that are going to need to be trained, not only in what to think, but also in how to live. And guess what? Again, the Bible is useful for that. The Bible can help us learn how to live right. Now, all of this culminates uh, in these next words. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So all of the, all the things we've been talking about, all the work that the Bible wants to do in our lives and God wants to do in our lives through the Bible, all the the change God wants to bring into our lives in creed and conduct, in the way we think and in the way we live, it's all for a purpose. And that purpose is this, so that we would be equipped for the mission that God has given us. And so it's, it's like Paul is telling Timothy, listen, the scripture is useful. It's useful for creed and conduct. And all of that is designed so that your people would be thoroughly equipped, not just a little equipped, not just barely competent, but thoroughly equipped at everything they need, everything they need to accomplish the mission they have. And so as the people of God, listen, if you feel ill-equipped for any part of the mission, whether it's sharing your faith or whether it's serving God, whatever it is, Scripture's claim is, man, you've got everything you need right here. And if we would just be people of the Word man, how our lives could be transformed. There's this great quote from John Scott. He said, Do we hope either in our own lives or in our own teaching ministry to overcome error and grow in truth, 
to overcome evil and grow in holiness, then it is to Scripture that we must primarily turn. For Scripture is profitable for these things. Indeed, Scripture is the chief means God employs to bring the man of God to maturity. Everything that we need to be mature, to be equipped for our mission, is right inside this book. See the treasure for what it is. Now we'll close with a few ideas for application, as I always try to do. And the first idea is simple, but it's for anyone here who would be brave enough to admit that you're a skeptic still. And first, welcome. We are so glad you're here. There are many people who are on the, the, the continuum of believing and being fully convinced and needing a little more convincing. And so to you, my first application is this. Paul, in the first verse we read, said, Timothy, you have become convinced. Continue on in what you've become convinced of. Timothy had taken the time to examine the evidence, to look everything over, and to decide and, and to become convinced this is the Word of God, this is useful, this is useful for studying, it is useful in my ministry. And I want you to become convinced, too. Um, how do you do that? If you are an astute student, you have listened to my sermon and you've been thinking this thought. Bill, that's a circular argument you've just made. I'm about to write off everything you said because, great, the Bible says it's the Word of God, but you have to believe the Bible in order to read the Bible and believe that it is the Word of God. So you've just created an endless loop for me. So they don't yet accept the Bible, so why are you trying to tell me the Bible says the Bible's the Word of God? Well, in a certain extent, sir or madam, you are correct. <laughs> I have just made a 20-minute circular argument, but that's the first step in understanding this. It's important to understand what the Bible claims it is first. We don't want to make the Bible into something it doesn't claim it is, that it never claimed it was. And second, for some of you, uh, that's enough. Uh, there's a certain sense in which you can look all around us and the glory of God shines through creation enough for you to see there's a God. And parallel to that, there are some of you who you look into this book and you read it and the glory of God shines through it in a parallel similar way where you just say, I don't need a lot of external proofs. This is the word of God. I just know it. Now, there are some, though, who would like to get out of that circular argument. And for you, um, I have some ideas. I want you to know that, uh, listen, there is good evidence. There's historical evidence that the Bible is true. There's archaeological evidence the Bible is true. There's manuscript evidence. There's prophetic evidence. There's internal consistency evidence. Uh, we should teach a class about this sometime. I'll give you the like three-minute version, okay? The historical evidence is this, that the Bible exists in real history. There are real people. Pontius Pilate was a real person. And if you look up other records outside the Bible, they corroborate what the Bible said. There's nothing in history that contradicts what the Bible says. That's important. Parallel to that, there's archaeological evidence. Every new archaeological dig they do overseas is discovering more and more evidence that, again, corroborates and never denies what the Bible said. When Jess and I were in Israel just before COVID, they had just unearthed a part of the city that, where the priests used to live, and it corroborated what the Bible said. It's really interesting. Everything that's going on in archaeology says this book is trustworthy, and it is true. But even beyond that, listen, there is manuscript evidence. Uh, what do I mean by that? You take any classic work of literature. I've got Homer's Iliad here with me now. And for most of the classics, we do not have the original document. For many, we only have 20 or 30 or 40 manuscripts dated a millennia, a thousand years after the original. For the Iliad, we have to have 600 some. 
But listen, we, we accept that this really is the work of Homer and that the words really are his with just that amount of evidence. Well, the Bible has so much more. The New Testament alone has 6,000 manuscripts with copies dating as close to 100 years to the original. And, and listen, none of those manuscripts contain deviations or errors or changes that significantly affect the original. It's been preserved for us with remarkable uh, studiousness. Fourth is prophetic evidence. You can just read the Old Testament for yourself. A canon that was closed 400 years before Christ. And there are hundreds, some say up to 300 prophecies, written and sealed about Christ that came true in Christ. That really speaks to its divine authorship. Prophetic fulfillment. And then finally, the internal evidence. So you read this book, and you don't see any contradictions. And also, you don't. what you do see is you see a remarkably consistent story from beginning to end. Although it was written by 40 people over the course of 1,500 years, you see a remarkably consistent document written by one author, ultimately, God himself. It's a beautiful storyline of our salvation. So like I said, that's just a brief introduction to why we should trust the Bible. It's so much more trustworthy than similar books out there with so much less evidence for them. It's trustworthy. If you want to learn more in the lobby, I've got books called Can I Trust the Bible by R.C. Sproul. Free to you. Pick up one if you like today or next week. And uh, I would love as well to engage in an email thread with you and point you to some more really detailed books if that's something you're interested in as well. Now for the rest of us, my application is this. Continue on. Continue on in creed and continue on in conduct. Um, so, so many in the world today want to stray away from what the Bible says is true. So many people are eager to leave behind things that feel like they should be left in the past. My message to you is the same as Paul's message to Timothy. Don't turn away. Continue on. It's true that the church as a whole really needs this now, but it's true that you as a person, you as a human being, you need this right now too. And so I want to encourage you to spend 10 minutes a day reading the Bible. Nothing fancy. You don't have to do a study. You don't have to read anything else. I just want to get you in the Word. And so for you, somebody here right now, I want you to set an alarm on your phone. Every day, at the same time. And that alarm just says, it's, it's time to read the Word for 10 minutes. Put it on your Google Calendar if that's your thing. Start a plan with the Bible app. There are a lot of different ways to do this. Call a friend, get some accountability. Do whatever you have to do to get in the Word. I promise you it will change your life. All those things we talked about, it will equip you to do. And then next, continue on in conduct as well. This book is not just about learning things, but it's meant to change our lives and to change the way that we live. You're not reading this book to be puffed up with knowledge, but to be filled up with God's love. And so let me encourage you, after you spend 10 minutes reading, would you spend 10 minutes praying and allowing God to form you and to speak to you and to personalize and to apply what you've read to your life? and the things you struggle with, and the people you struggle with, and, and your workplace, and your kids, your family. Again, I know, it's 20 minutes. 20 minutes feels like a lot, doesn't it? Think about the amount of time you spend scrolling social media. I'll just speak for myself. It's more than 20 minutes. Think about the time that you spend watching TV or, or Netflix. I'll just speak for me again. More than 20 minutes. We can find the time if we want to. And we can be formed by God's word instead of our own culture, if we choose to. And then finally this morning, our last application, I want to encourage you to see God's word for its ultimate purpose. In that very first verse we read, I skipped over a part on purpose, put a pen in it till right now. Paul told Timothy, For from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Listen, the ultimate purpose 
of the Bible, the ultimate reason that we have it is to make us wise for salvation, to know uh, the storyline that God has revealed here of the promised Savior, the coming Savior, the Savior who came and died in your place. And on every page, if you look and you read and you pray, you'll find it, that we are sinners. We have fallen so far short of what God has asked of us. And as our Creator, He has the right to ask that of us. But Scripture also reveals the way that He's provided an escape from the punishment we deserve. God took all my sin and put it on Jesus on the cross and punished him in my place. And so would you, maybe it's your first time even understanding this, would you come to understand that this book is all about making you wise for salvation? And if that is you, would you please, please, please look me up today, find me on this lawn, and let's talk more about that and pray more about that together. Well, folks, as a church as a whole, let's rededicate ourselves to this book. Can we trust it? Absolutely. Is it unique? Absolutely. Is it useful? You bet it is. And our church is as healthy as we commit ourselves to be people of the Word. Let's pray. God, thank you for this Word. Thank you. We are so blessed to have one on every bookshelf. People throughout history have died for this book. They have died just trying to get their hands on it, to hold it, to read it. And God, throughout all those centuries, the Bible has stood firm and has stood the test of time. And after all that time, it's still here. And it's still speaking. It's still transforming our lives. Uh, we believe you have breathed out these words for us. And we need that breath like we need breath in our lungs. It is life to us. It is nourishment to us. It is more precious to us than gold or silver. It's powerful. God, help us to be people of the word. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. close with the song Ancient Words if you could stand and sing with us please <laughs>
Well, thank you again for being here today, everybody. I hope you have a great, beautiful rest of your weekend in God's creation. Stick around, meet some new folks, enjoy some fellowship. Grab a book if you're interested. And uh, don't forget, another great opportunity for fellowship is tomorrow, Monday at 7 o'clock at the Ada Village General Store. Free ice cream, come on out, get some ice cream, hang out, meet some new people, and catch up with old friends. We'd love to see you there tomorrow at 7. Uh, let me dismiss you now with this blessing uh, and this reminder that God is with you and God is for you in this world and has equipped you for every task that he's put in front of you through his word. So go now in the grace, love, and peace of our God, his Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.